Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Dan the Tutor. Today we are going to be talking about energy, specifically conservation of energy, which is one of my favorite topics in the entire year. So before we talk about the conservation of energy, let's just talk about the three kinds of energy we can have in this class. The first kind is gravitational potential energy. I've seen different symbols for this. Some people use PE for potential energy. Most physics textbooks use the expression U sub G. I don't know why U, but they call it U. And that is just equal to MGH, the mass times the acceleration of gravity, which is 9.8, positive 9.8, and then times a height. So that's what gravitational potential energy is. You will have it whenever you have a height. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So if you are overlooking a really high cliff, you have potential energy. The second kind of energy there is, is kinetic energy. This is one of the most famous equations in all of physics. I usually see this written as K, and K equals one half mv squared, one half mass times velocity squared. And obviously you will have kinetic energy whenever you have a velocity, in other words, whenever you're moving. And then the third and final kind of energy we'll care about in this class is spring potential energy, which probably shows up the least, but it's still good to know this equation. The equation is U sub S for spring equals one half K X squared. And this one I do have to explain. It's one half times K is the spring constant. And then X is the stretch distance. So in other words, how far are you stretching your spring? Like if I have a spring and this is like a normal spring, like five meters long, but then I stretch it to eight meters long, what's X in this case? Well, X is the difference between these. The X would be three meters in this case because it's the stretch distance. By the way, it's not just a stretch. It could also be compressed. So in other words, you can make it shorter to let's say two meters and that would be three as well because five minus two is still three. So in other words, X is just the stretch distance. How far are you pulling it or compressing it from its initial rest length? Where I'm saying in this example, five meters is the rest length. Oh, and the spring constant. So a spring constant is basically, well, first of all, it depends on the spring. Different springs have different spring constants. If I have a spring that is very stiff, like if you've ever tried to stretch a trampoline spring, for example, like the trampolines you jump on, those springs are extremely difficult to stretch out. And because of that, they have a very high spring constant. Something with a very low spring constant is something very easy to take apart, to stretch. Can you think of a spring that has a very low spring constant, specifically one that's a child's play toy? If you said the slinky, you would be correct and you can collect your prize in the description below. So yes, a slinky has a very low spring constant because that thing is extremely easy to pull apart. And now let's talk about the conservation of energy equation, which is one of the coolest equations in all of physics. And I'm not just saying that, I, I mean it. The conservation of energy equation says E total initial equals E total final. In other words, if you add up all of the initial energies in your system, they must be equal to the final energy in the system. And I have to put a note here at the bottom, energy must be conserved. And I'll explain what that means in five minutes. So just give me a second. Let's look at an example real quick. Let's say I have a ball and it rolls down a hill into a spring that's gonna catch it. So in other words, I have a ball up here, the height of this hill is let's say five meters. Initially that ball is moving at one meter per second. The ball has a mass of let's say two kilograms and you know it's gonna roll down this hill and I have two questions. Number one, what is the speed at the bottom of the hill? And two, let's say the spring constant is 100 newtons per meter. My question is once it gets to the spring, how much does it compress it? What's the X distance of compression? So the first thing we need to do for this problem is pick our initial and our final point. We're actually gonna have to do this twice. 
So the first initial point is up here. The final point, if we want to find velocity, we're going to choose this point right here. If we want to find the final with the spring, we're going to move the final to the spring itself. So anyways, what kind of energy do I have at the initial spot? I want you to think about it. Answer it in your own head. What kind of energy do we have at the initial spot? Your answer choices are kinetic, potential due to gravity, potential due to spring, or a combination of them. The answer is there is a combination of gravitational potential and kinetic. And the reason why is because you have gravitational potential energy because you have a height, five meters. So that's going to be mgh, which I'll fill in the variables later. Plus, you have kinetic energy too. Why? Because you're moving. And when you're moving, you have a kinetic energy. So one half mv squared. And there's no spring potential at the top because there is no spring at the top. So now we can fill in these variables. The mass was 2, g is 9.8, and the height is 5, plus 1 half mass again is 2, and velocity is 1 squared. Let's see what I get when I plug this in a calculator. Wow, would you look at that? 99. And the units for energy, by the way, are joules. It's the same units for work, which maybe that means we'll deal with work in a later video with energy. Who knows? That's a yes, by the way. But not right now, because we're just talking about energy. So 99 joules. Now for the final point, what kind of energy do I have? Think about that. Remember the final point is at the bottom of the hill. Well, let's think about this. What kind of energy do I have? Well, I definitely have kinetic energy because I'm moving, I've got some velocity. And I don't have any gravitational potential energy because the height's zero, you're at the bottom and you're not touching the spring yet, so it sounds like it's all kinetic. E total final equals one half mv squared. And I know the mass is still two, and that velocity is what I'm solving for. Now, like I said before, I can set these energies equal to each other. This equals 99. The one half and the two cancel. It looks like v squared equals 99. This is gonna be like just barely less than 10. It's gonna be like 9.9 .9 or something. Yeah, 9.95 meters per second. That's the speed at the bottom. Now again, that's just the answer for the first one. We also want to find the final compression of the spring. So to do that, all I need to do is move my final point. The initial's fine, I don't need to move it, but I do need to move the final point. Now the cool thing about this is, I already found the initial energy. It's still 99 joules. And what this should mean to you is that no matter where you are in this system, no matter how high you are, no matter what, you will always have 99 joules of energy in this system. Always. So that means E total initial, still 99. And then E total final, what kind of energy do I have at the final? Let's think about this. I don't have a height, so I don't have any gravitational potential energy. I definitely have spring potential energy because there's a spring involved. But do I have kinetic energy? Well, what's the speed of the ball when it's fully compressed? The answer should be zero because it's stopped. It's fully compressed. So what that means is energy total final is just equal to one half kx squared, where I said k is 100 and x is what I'm solving for. That equals 99. So one half times 100, 50x squared equals 99. Divide by 50, I get 1.98 and then take the square root of that, we'll get a compression distance of 1.41 meters. That's how far the spring compresses. So hopefully we had fun with that one. And if not, then oh well. Now there's one more thing I want to talk about today, and that is I mentioned everything that we just covered only works when energy is conserved. I still want to talk about when it's not conserved. So let's set up a t-chart here and talk about the different cases. So first of all, with conserved, we're talking about the following forces. We're talking about gravity, normal force, or any perpendicular force, and that's the symbol for perpendicular. What I'm talking about is, for instance, let's say you have a ball attached to a string and the object is moving that way. Well, the tension force would be pointing up these two vectors are perpendicular to each other because they're 90 degrees apart. Energy is conserved in this case. 
So that's what I mean by any perpendicular force. Normally it's just tension, but it has to be perpendicular, like a ball on a pendulum, for instance. So these are the conserved forces. For non-conserved forces, there's a lot more bad guys out there. Oh, wait, I missed one conserved force. Spring force is also conservative because it shows up in the spring potential energy equation. Now for the non-conservative forces, we've got public enemy number one, friction. When you see friction, it means energy is not conserved because you're losing energy due to friction. Other common non-conservative forces are air resistance, which we typically don't deal with in this class, but if you do, that's not conserved. And then any push slash pull forces, that is not going to be conservative either. Because if you think about it, when you push an object, you're kind of adding energy to your system so it's not being conserved. When we say conserved, we specifically mean that the energy is transferred from one form to another. Like for instance, it's transferred from potential energy to kinetic energy or to spring energy. That's exactly what we saw in the Hill example above. Energy was being converted instead of gained or lost. With non-conservative energy, we would say that energy is added or lost from the system. And the system is just any object you have. In the last example, it was the ball on the hill. And then the last thing I do want to say is that we do have two different equations for conserved versus non-conserved. For conserved is the equation we already saw earlier, E total initial equals E total final. And if energy is not conserved, then we have this equation instead. E total initial plus the work is equal to E total final. In other words, the work is the reason why energy is not conserved. Work due to friction, work due to a pushing or pulling force. And remember that work W is just equal to a force times a distance times cosine theta. But really how I want you to think of these equations, energy total initial is like your initial, the work is like your change and E total F is like your final. So all this is saying in English is the initial energy plus the change equals the final. And your work, by the way, can be negative. Like for instance, friction a lot of times has a negative work. Why? Because it's losing energy from the system. The change is negative. And other times when you're, for instance, pulling an object up a hill, you're adding energy to the system. So work is positive. And we'll look at more specific examples of that in the next video. I just wanted to show you this difference because it is important that we know the difference between conserved and not conserved. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care and bye-bye.